My name is Phil, and my wife Amy and I are fixing an old house. Here are some of the tools we found most useful in the construction phase. You don't need to run out and buy all of these tools, but unless you can chop through wood with your bare hands, you can't fix an old house without some of them. The most important tools were the personal protective equipment. We wore safety glasses, hearing protection, gloves of various kinds, including ones with impact protection, and dust masks. And we both need knee pads for our old knees. If you're going to build walls, you'll find yourself wishing for a pneumatic nail gun. But here's the dilemma. You need to spend a lot of money to get a reliable nail gun, and then you will find there's no such thing as a universal nail gun. They are all specialized. There are framing and sheathing nailers and sheathing staplers. There are roofing nailers that are designed to work with specialized roofing nails. There are all sorts of smaller nailers for finish work and cabinetry. And there are special nailers for flooring and special nailers for siding and fencing. We have a brad nailer for trim work. If you buy a compressor, you might find you can get a bundle that comes with a good hose and a pneumatic tool of some sort. And that's what we did. However, that brad nailer is basically just for trim work. And then there's an almost universal solution for the DIYer. Palm nailers can handle most framing and sheathing jobs. They can fit in smaller spaces where pneumatic nail guns can't go. And they can squeeze into spaces where you can't swing a hammer. They can drive the small ring shank nails used for subfloors. They're one of the most versatile ways to drive nails, and they're pretty dang cheap. You can pick up a good one at your local home improvement store for between 35 wow. and 100 bucks. That is awesome. If you try hard, you can spend up to about $170, but they don't come any more expensive than that. You can find them even cheaper on Amazon, but I'm not sure whether you want to spend 20 bucks on a pneumatic tool. I haven't tried it, but Milwaukee also makes a battery-powered one, which seems like it would be a great alternative if you don't have a compressor. That palm nailer is fun to use. Speaking of pneumatic tools, the brad nailer that came bundled with our compressor is a DeWalt, and it has done an excellent job so far with the relatively little amount of trim we've installed to date. It's light and easy to use, and you can switch it from sequential shot, where you have to pull the trigger each time, to bump mode, where it will fire each time you put it against some wood, or pretty much anything else. For safety's sake, I recommend the sequential shot mode, since you might find yourself holding that trigger down and firing a brad nail into your thigh. Ouch! Or worse. <coughs> By the way, if you've never seen Penn Gillette do his nail gun routine, it's amazing. Seriously, Google it. If you are attaching a wall to concrete, you can rent or borrow an impact drill. I own a fairly light duty one, but I've found that it takes quite a long time to drill into concrete and set in an anchor screw of one type or other. So I thought I would try using a powder actuated nailer and suddenly everything concrete looks like it needs a piece of lumber nailed to it. They use little 22 caliber blanks to fire a nail through the wood into the concrete. I bought one that is triggered by hitting it with a hammer and I had to get over the flinch factor in order to hit the trigger squarely so it would fire. It's weird that the fact that it goes bang when you hit it makes me a little less likely to hit it than a chisel, which is almost exactly the same action. There are other powder actuated nailers that have a finger trigger. You might consider spending the extra dough if you have a big project. I got some advice from an experienced user and bought the yellow loads to go with the nails, which are sometimes called drive pins. There are bigger, heavier duty ones, and even ones that use collated nails and power loads in strips that the professionals use. On a couple of occasions, I needed to use a second load to get the nail flush with the wood. I assume the nail hit something hard in the concrete. As you might expect, you should definitely use hearing protection, although I was surprised that it wasn't as loud as I thought it would be. Electronic stud finders are way better than the old wiggly magnet doodad where you hoped you would find a nail or a drywall screw, and then you hoped it was in a stud, not blocking. They don't always work for really old lath and plaster walls, but for modern drywall construction, they're really good. After the walls were painted and we couldn't see the lines we had marked where the studs were, it was pretty easy to mark the stud and use a spirit level and a pencil to mark the walls so we could mount kitchen cabinets. I bought a laser level, 
and it literally transformed my life. Well, that might be a bit strong, but wow, those things are useful. Where we used to get by using a spirit level and a plumb bob, now we can draw a level line around an entire room. And this level does three axes, 360 degree perpendicular lines. It has a rechargeable battery and can also take AA batteries. It comes with a mount that can fit on a camera tripod. And it also has some pretty strong magnets that you can use to mount it on steel. I found a spare camera tripod and a couple of pieces of angle steel left over from demolishing the elevator were all I needed to set a level line anywhere I wanted. If the tripod wouldn't work because it was too tall, I simply screwed the angle steel to a stud and stuck the level on it using the magnet. I also built a short stand so I could stick the laser down low at the height I wanted to mount electrical boxes. It helped us lay out all of the walls we needed to build. Electrical boxes are all the same level in each room, and when it comes to tiling floors and walls, it really helps you get nice straight grout lines. We used the cordless drill and cordless impact driver to install cabinets, screw blocking to studs, and drive the structural joist screws we used for joists, and to quickly knock up a closet wall where, strictly speaking, nails weren't required since the walls were partition walls and non-structural. By the way, I don't work for Milwaukee and I'm not getting anything from them, so this is my personal opinion. Our Milwaukee battery-powered drill and impact driver have lasted nine years so far, and I still have the original batteries. They've been dropped from various heights, including from ladders onto concrete, more times than I would care to admit. They're tough, really tough, and we have yet to kill one. I'm tempted to put them in my will. Another drill we used was the right angle drill. This is another old tool we bought used, and this thing is a beast with amazing torque. It can easily snap a small shank on an auger bit. If you are drilling holes for electrical wiring, you'll be using an auger bit, and at some point it will bind up. If you have a big right angle drill, and if you're using a bit with a quarter inch shank, it will snap off, leaving you with an unfinished hole with an auger bit permanently embedded anything more than a couple of circuits and it is probably worth borrowing or renting a right angle drill and getting auger bits in a few lengths including a long one called a ship auger. But be sure to get ones with really beefy shanks around 7 16 to 1 half inch. Depending on how many wires you're pulling you can probably get away with one size 3 quarter or 7 8 If you're doing lighting and power in one room such as a bathroom you might want to simply use a spade bit and put up with the extra time it takes to bore the holes in studs. If you use a big right angle drill with a hole saw, be prepared. I had a 4 inch hole saw bind up while drilling a hole for a light fixture box in the ceiling and the drill whipped around and I punched myself in the head with my hand. I barely kept my balance on the ladder. If you've watched my channel, you know my opinion about clamps. You can never have enough clamps. But in the case of rough carpentry, you actually only need a few. I found that a short pipe clamp was helpful in forcing warped studs together so they were straighter. They also help you when you don't have someone to hold on to studs or other lumber while you bang in the first nail or two. Portable lights are super helpful and we couldn't have worked in the attic or late into the night without them. And since we had to run power from the garage to the house, we used some long heavy duty extension cords. If you are running small items like battery chargers, a small gauge extension cord should be fine, but we were running things like saws and shop vacs. So we were using at least one 100 foot 12 gauge cord for the big tools and smaller 14 gauge cords for the other stuff. Since they were exposed to the weather, we made sure that there was a W in the cord type embossed into the outer jacket. We used both a circular saw and a sliding compound miter saw. 
The circular saw is perfect for cutting a large sheet stock like stub flooring. I think my skill saw was the first power tool I bought. The sliding compound miter saw is one of the most used tools in our remodel. So far we've used it to cut wall studs, top plates, bottom plates, and the miter joints in some of the trim. We'll continue to use it to cut wood flooring and finish the trim throughout the house. The oscillating saw is really handy for cutting stuff straight on, and you can pretty much carve with it. You won't win any art competitions, but you might be able to remodel a house, and that counts. I mentioned our shop vacuum in a previous video. Our ancient 16 gallon rigid brand shop vac was old but still did a great job. It's the only appliance on a job site where sucking is a good thing and boy did that old vacuum suck. Unfortunately, a few days ago it started smelling like smoke and we decided to buy a new one. The new one is also a 16 gallon rigid brand wet dry vacuum. The old one is going to join the old Metabo grinder in their final resting place in a local landfill. I have a few observations about the new vacuum. The old one came with a push handle and that was pretty convenient. The new one doesn't have one so moving it around means bending down a little, which is kind of a pain in the back. The new one has accessory mounts molded into the plastic where the old one had a handy bag that hung from the handle which allowed me to collect accessories that I found useful rather than the ones that came with the vacuum. Also, the new one is a bit noisier. The hoses and nozzles feel a bit lighter so the first impression is they're a bit cheaper. However, I should point out that I paid maybe 50 bucks more for this one than the one I bought in 2004, so accounting for inflation, I can't complain even if this one doesn't last 17 years like the last one. We bought a used rolling scaffold, commonly called a baker's scaffold, because we are refinishing the wooden ceilings in the house. One drawback to these is they often only have railings at the ends, so you can fall from them easily. For us, the ceilings are pretty low, so the fall would have been short. But if you are using one at its max height, you should park it against a wall and make a top rail and mid rail out of 2x4s, or better yet, buy the railing and outrigger accessories from the manufacturer so you don't fall and the scaffold doesn't tip over. When we're done with it, we'll probably sell ours on unless we find the next remodel quickly. Here are some of the other, more obvious tools we use continually. Tape measures. More than one since there are two of us. Grinder. Ladders. Tool belt. Carpenter square. And other squares. I'll cover some other specialized tools when I do videos for drywall and tile and for the wiring. Like I said earlier, you don't need to run out and buy all these tools before you decide to fix up a house, but you definitely should budget for some of them and it helps the sticker shock to buy as you go. Also, used tools are usually just as good as the new ones, as long as the guards and other safety features are still there. Don't hesitate to check out the used tools online. But as with everything, people usually overvalue what they're selling, so it helps to know the cost for the same tool, new. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to drop a comment. If you enjoyed this video, or even if you just like listening to the mesmerizing tone of my voice, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to click on the bell next to the word subscribe so you get notified when I upload another video. Thanks for watching. The mesmerizing, the mesmerizing tone of my voice. 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 The mesmerizing tone of my voice.